not with drugs and human trafficking, but to present themselves for a parole. Something involving, in this instance, say Mexico and Texas. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I just have one, one question, because I'm, I'm trying to understand the effect if this were to become law. And earlier you mentioned foreign policy, and, and that's why I'm asking. The state of Texas is, is only dealing with its territorial boundary, and if individuals were to come to a port of entry and present themselves Texas would have no say. Is that correct under your interpretation of if, if this uh, bill became law? I don't know that it goes there. I, I think what Justice Kavanaugh was talking about, though, is because you're dealing with something involving, in this instance, say, Mexico and Texas, uh, a foreign country. Um, and in, in the immigration context, the courts are going to give additional discretion to the executive or deference to the executive branch as they exercise their discretion. Well, the question, though, is isn't Texas on Texas land of the state of Texas uh, basically uh, asserting their antitrust pass? So, you know, I know that there's a lot of debate about cutting fence, not cutting fence. But from a practical standpoint, if everybody who wanted to come into this country, not with drugs and human trafficking, but to present themselves for a parole came to the port of entry gate, wouldn't that circumvent Texas while people who are coming on and trespassing onto Texas private or pr Texas public property are actually where the governor is in, is in place? I, I just want to understand what we're empowering, and it seems like we're empowering in-state and on no, under no circumstances, because I'm not disagreeing, you go to the middle of the, uh, of the Rio Grande, you may be in, te in Mexico, and that's outside of Texas's jurisdiction, but the, the fence, as I understand it now, is in, uh, is in Texas. May I answer? Uh, I'm not sure about the fence part, but if you're talking about each state having the ability to enforce antitrust pass laws, um, I think the reason the Supreme Court and the federal government don't go in that direction with respect to migration, immigration, is because you would have potentially 50 different versions of what would be crossing that line or not. The time of the gentle lady has expired. Uh, the gentle lady yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Van Der is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a uh, fascinating, interesting, uh, enjoyable discussion. It is. Um, however, I just wanted there were certain things, and I might digress a tiny bit, but the ranking member from New York mentioned that the Republicans rejected a good border bill, a tough border bill. I, I, I can't just let that statement go. The border bill that the Senate did, and we'll never see the light of day, hope to God, in, in the House, did nothing to stop catch and release. It did nothing to continue to build the wall. It did not institute the Remain in Mexico policy. It didn't allow the immediate expediting of individuals who did get through back to their country of origin. It did allow close to 2 million illegals a year into the United States, almost codifying what is illegal. It did allow 50,000 work permits per year. And I, you know what I want to say here is I don't know that we'd have to have these discussions, colloquies, and debates if the executive branch just did its damn job. They're not doing their job. I, the executive branch itself is basically allowing the law to be broken, and I would maintain is breaking the law. This administration is terrible. It doesn't enforce the law of the land. And as far as resources that would mention, believe me, if this administration was enforcing the law and instituting all of the things that I just mentioned that need to be done and more, if they did all that, I can personally guarantee that this Congress, at least this side of the aisle, would now, because of the extreme nature of the situation, get those resources to the administration so they could do their job. But meanwhile, they're not. And meanwhile, it's incumbent upon the Judiciary Committee and the House of Representatives to ensure that we do everything within our legal ability and framework to stop the disaster that's going on. Because any of the folks at home that might be listening to this conversation, 
They may not understand all the technicalities. They may not all understand the interesting parts of the debate and the fascinating intellectual duel that takes place. But you know what they do understand? They do understand that you know, two cops were beaten up by over a dozen individuals who came here illegally because we couldn't even check who they were and where they're going. They do understand what it's doing to our country. So I support this legislation. I support Order. all the legislation that's coming to me today. With the gentleman. I, th I, th I thank Representative Bishop, my friend from North Carolina. And yes, I will yield. I, I thank the gentleman. It, it, and it, it affords an opportunity to make an, uh, a little, or advance your point in this way. I said a moment ago that Democrats want open borders. That's the reason they're opposed to this. But it's actually a little more complex. They want open borders, but they have a desperate political need to avoid the political consequences of open borders. What is happening is throughout the country, people in every area, every region, every city are experiencing the catastrophic consequences of uncontrolled open borders. And so what the, what the, the bill, frankly, that came from the Senate was about was an exercise in excuse making, shifting political blame, because all of the blame belongs on, on the Biden administration that undertook this radical policy in the teeth of, congressional, of congressionally enacted law. So much of what they've done, not every single thing, but much of it has been absolutely lawless, in addition to stupid, lawless. And so the reason this bill needs to get in the hopper is because leadership of the, in the Republican leadership in the House, the Speaker has said, we're not, we are going to have actual border security and we're not going to proceed until we do. You can pass all the bills like that came out of the Senate that you want, and the other side will say, well, see, we've gotten everything covered because it's Congress's fault, and Congress is a broken immigration system, and so Congress has done a bill, and they can keep rolling. They can institutionalize the policy that they embarked upon January 2021, which has led to the circumstances that exist today that are destroying the president politically and the Democrats, and I'd like to reclaim my time. Yes, sir. And I, I thank you for that. And you're exactly right. So getting back to what the ranking member said, that bill that came from the Senate is a nothing burger. It did nothing. It didn't accomplish anything. And it did more harm than good. And as my friend from North Carolina said, institutionalized and legalized what is an illegal activity. I thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a good point in time for a little bit of fact checking. Um, I, I, I'm, and I'd like to speak directly to the American people at this point. I represent a border community, an incredible border community, El Paso, Texas, the only member on this committee who goes back home to the border every in district work period, the only one who speaks regularly with NGOs, local governments, Border Patrol, OFO, uh, who, who really can speak with some authority on this. I can tell you the biggest challenge that we face today is congressional inaction, but even more than congressional in inaction is the intransigence of my Republican colleagues. The President asked us for added funding, a border supplemental. It now sits on a shelf gathering dust. So Border Patrol agents, OFO officers in my community do not have access to the resources that they need in order to provide border security. Whose fault is that? My Republican colleagues. The Senate worked on a bipartisan compromise and before the ink was dry, who opposed it? Republican colleagues. Something that Republicans on the Senate side claimed would be the toughest border legislation ever passed by Congress. And, and what did Repub House Republicans do? They balked at it before they even read the text. They've made it clear over and over and over again, they don't want a solution, they want the issue, they want to create chaos, and they do that by withholding funding for the Department of Homeland Security. I think it is also very important to point out the fact that they keep saying that the president alone can fix this. Actually, 
I didn't hear them saying that when they passed their ridiculous HR2. They claimed that that legislation was needed, but then all of a sudden, no, the president alone can fix it. As an example of the incredible hypocrisy coming from the other side of the aisle, they keep claiming that the president is not doing everything he can under the law. I'll give you an example. If, according to them, they'd like to see every asylum seeker jailed. Every single person arriving at our nation's southern border, they want jailed. I think that's a, not just a terrible waste of money, but I think it's inhumane and it's not necessary when there are alternatives to detention, but that's what they want. And guess what? They have failed to give the president the funding to do it. So I don't know where they think the president will come up with the money to do what they claim he's not doing. It sure is not coming from Congress. I don't know if he's supposed to look under couches in the White House for spare change, but it's been this House Republican group that has withheld the resources and withheld legislation, uh, failing, absolutely failing to do their job. So every time you hear a member of the GOP blame the president, it really, I, I hope the American people hold up a mirror to them and remind them of what they have failed to do and what they have failed to do is their job. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back, seeks recognition. The gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady from Texas, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe you have the same memory as President Biden, but I, I came over to you and reminded you that I have 55 miles of the Mexican border in east of San Diego, and that I have led more than 20 trips to the border with attorneys generals, members of Congress, even former baseball player Steve Garvey, uh, and both Republicans and Democrats, but mayors and so on. Uh, we spend a lot of time at the border, and yes, we do talk to those NGOs. So hopefully, in the future, we can at least agree that there's more than one of us on this committee that has the Mexican border. Not with, notwithstanding that, thank you, but notwithstanding that, the Mexican border or the border of every foreign country now has no border. And that's what we're dealing with here today is the right of all 50 states to take action when possible. Now, the gentlelady rightfully so said the president's run out of money. Uh, He's run out of money by giving tickets, air tickets, to people to go where they want to go when they enter the country. He's run out of money by misusing uh, border assets, including literally costing more to not build a fence slash wall from day one. So I have some sympathy for he's out of money, but I have no belief that if we gave him more money that anything would change. As a matter of fact, I'm quite sure what he wants is more money for more housing for New York so they can be happy with them instead of unhappy. Now, having said that, there is no question at all that, and I've been here over 20 years, that sometime in the future when the Democrats are in the majority, they will propose a very similar bill on a different subject. They will want to give every attorney general, as they have for the 20 years I've served before, the right to sue, and every individual. So the debate here, we bring it back to what it is, the debate is about the injured states, and albeit many of the Democrat mayors are saying that they're injured too, having standing to, in fact, do something about it to the extent they can. Uh, now, we realize that if you show up at the border and the president issues a blanket parole, which is in violation with the parole statute, he just automatically paroles everybody, there's not much they can do. And Mr. Ivey said rightfully so. You know, some parts of this are vested only in the president and vested in, in the foreign powers that work with him. Having said that, we're here today because the president has not faithfully enforced the laws in a way that was previously demonstrated by the previous administration. It's that simple. The numbers reflect it. And I'm going to use the remaining two minutes, not that I'm a conspiracy person, but I, I believe that you can and should predict why something happens. I believe that this president, in concert with his uh, executives uh, and his advisors, <clears throat> from day one 
wanted to change America and change the demographics of America for political purposes. I believe that he made the decision to get 10 or 12 million people into the next census that would predominantly live in minority areas, that my Democrat friends, at least in the blue states, would be able to draw districts to enhance not only the number of members of the House, but in fact, change the outcome of the Electoral College. Now, if my members on the other side don't believe in that, then we should begin looking at the census so that we not count people that have been paroled in this country as though they were voting citizens for redistricting. We have until 2030. But I will tell you, as I propose that, I know that I will not find a Democrat co-sponsor because for a Democrat to do it is to work against the interest of the president and this administration who knowingly are letting people into this country, not because they're going to vote, but because the way the census works and then the uh, apportionment, the White House and the House of Representatives are at stake in 2032. If, it, if we don't change the law, if we don't do what former President Trump and uh, Wilbur Ross were attempting to do, which is get back to asking the question, are you a citizen or not? And if you're not a citizen, you don't get counted for the reapportionment. That is what is at stake here. So I'm going to vote for this bill. I'm going to vote for every bill, but the most important bill is one that we're going to have to do to keep from losing our democracy because of the treasonous work of this president. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from uh, Pennsylvania is recognized. I move to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized. I cannot begin to say how offensive I found that last speech and that embrace of replacement theory is, but I would like to yield my time to Ms. Escobar. Thank you so much, Ms. Scanlon. The, the open embrace and use of the great replacement theory by Republicans really should send a chill down the spine of every American. And it is not just vile and offensive, but it's dangerous. And I'd like to remind my colleagues that that rhetoric uh, that embraces the great replacement theory was what was used on August 3rd, 2019 by a white supremacist who came into my community to slaughter immigrants and Hispanics because he was concerned about this great replacement. So I would just, again, like to ask my Republican colleagues to please be cognizant of the consequences to their language. But I think it's really important also to remember what is going on here. Republicans don't want to address the challenges and the opportunities that we face with immigration. It's a challenge because we're seeing a Western hemispheric refugee crisis that's impacting our country and other countries in the Western hemisphere. And instead of seeing it also as an opportunity to modernize our outdated immigration laws, because frankly, we need immigrants in our country. Immigrants make us stronger, more innovative. They may, immigrants make our country better. Instead of looking at this great challenge as an opportunity to change uh, Byzantine laws, what do they do? They try to not do their job, and they try to rile up their base. The same thing is happening in my state, unfortunately, of Texas, uh, where we have a governor who has spent tens of billions of dollars trying to rile up his base uh, with border tactics that haven't changed anything and have only uh, caused civil rights violations and a terrible waste of taxpayer money. Um, but I will close before I yield back to Ms. Scanlon by saying, for my colleague from California who's no longer here, he obviously has a problem listening because what I said was I'm the only member who lives on the border and goes home to the border every time we have an in-district work period. And for his information, um, I have brought nearly 25% of Congress to the border for holistic trips to view how the system isn't working and how we in Congress should be fixing it. With that, I'll yield back. Uh, Thank you. 
Uh, I just have one, one question, because I'm, I'm trying to understand the Texas. Well, people who are coming on and trespassing onto Texas private, if, if this uh, bill became law? I don't know that it goes something involving, in this instance, say, Mexico and Texas. Uh, and of the state of Texas uh, basically uh, asserting their anti-trespass foreign policy. And, and that's why I'm asking, the state of Texas there, I, I think what Justice Kavanaugh was talking about, though, is because you're dealing with or pr Texas public property or actually where the governor is in, is in place. So, you know, I know that there's a lot of debate about cutting fence, not cutting a, a foreign country. Um, and Im in the immigration context, exercise their discretion. Well, the question, though, is isn't Texas on Texas themselves Texas would have no say. Is that correct under your interpretation of 